And to me, that is such an enormous topic that I chose a few things to talk about. I'm just coming back from vacation and I did have a lot of jet lag, but um, I thought it would be interesting to just sort of stand back and look at um, where I have come in um, forming my company um, that focuses on accessible design. And I put the word designing for all, all in quotation marks, because one can never truly design for all. And I've learned that over the years, um, but we try. <laughs> um, so um, my name is Jane, um, Jane Borbrot. Um, I've worked in architecture for over 20 years, um, but um, my focus has become um, sort of more um, focused in on accessibility and inclusive design over the last seven or eight years. Um, and so in my talk, I'll talk a little bit about how and why um, and the story of how I did get into that specialization. Um, and <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about um, all the work I do in accessible design because it's not so much conventional architecture, but more consulting work. And just some general observations. Oh, Uli's coming in too. Great. Um, nice to see Uli here. <laughs> so yeah, so I'll be just um, talking about um, a few recent observations and thoughts. And I just want to, I hope that I communicate sort of a, a positive um, outlook because I do see a lot of change over the last seven years that I've been specializing in this uh, work, um, change for the better. So, um, so anyway, the, the story of Kuno, Kuno is my company name. Um, I will try to share the journey a little bit. Um, it really did start with one project um, because I had worked as an architect um, in big firms doing airports and community centers um, for many years before this specialization. It um, was really this one family project that was like the pivotal moment um, for me. And I really do think that for accessibility and accessible design, one does need either lived experience or some kind of big family involvement, a personal connection to disability to really sort of get it and not just like get the accessibility needs of the built environment, but to start seeing the shortcomings in our city, um, lack of resources, lack of accessibility. Um, so this project um, came about when my cousin, um, Madeline, so she's a very close cousin. Um, I think she was in her early 30s at the time. She um, was a filmmaker. She had just finished this wonderful documentary film that she had filmed in um, India with her friends. It was, um, and they were just starting to do all the launch events and stuff. And um, she was having funny symptoms and she was diagnosed with um, a brain tumor. So um, that whole journey started. Um, and she had surgery to remove the tumor that um, had complications. So she had um, a stroke during the surgery, which left her um, hemiplegic um, with lots of cognitive disabilities. Um, she needed to use a power chair. And um, like, you know, and this is all like out of the blue, like suddenly she could no longer live in her home. Um, she was discharged from GF Strong and the family really struggled to find somewhere for her to even live. Um, so um, yeah, this was all like new to us. Um, we didn't realize there was such a lack um, and just finding the resources um, was very difficult. So anyway, she found um, places to live. Like it's, it's not just finding a space to live in. Like one can find potentially a unit to live in by oneself but there's all the layered like needing caregivers and needing to go to constant um, appointments and all these layers of needs. So my aunt asked me, she had this cool idea. Um, there was this um, old house um, that our family um, had for many years. So 
This is actually a photo here from 57 uh, of some of my extended family. That's my grandmother. And this is my aunt, the one who started the project, sitting on the stairs of the house that we renovated. Um, so my aunt said, why don't we take this house and um, we'll, we'll design it um, to accommodate Madeline. And would you like to do it? <laughs> I was, of course, like, yes, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I both love heritage buildings and anything to do with, like, anything I can do to help my cousin I was on board with. Um, so the process, yeah, so this was a bit of a process. Just um, I had done accessibility in projects in the past in terms of taking building code and applying it to floor plans and not really kind of understanding anything beyond that really. Because in the past as an architect, if you follow code, you think, okay, good, I'm done, we are good. Um, so for this project, um, I really was keen to just really absorb all the books I could find. Um, and there weren't that many, like, and this was only like, seven, eight years ago. Um, I, I guess when I thought of my cousin, like this vibrant filmmaker who loved arts and everything, and then I would look at these like design guidelines that were just so, like they're good, they're guidelines, like they're not inspiring. And, and I just thought there's so much room uh, to have fun and to do something that both meets the accessibility needs but also um, can be beautiful and great design-wise. And that's always been my motivation. Um, and so, yeah, I've studied and read everything I could, but I also just spent a lot of time hanging out with my cousin and just seeing how she navigated the world. Um, I spent time at the various um, housing placements she had, and I would take a measuring tape and sketchbooks and measure the counters and measure the storage options um and watched other like her tenant her other roommates how they navigated um just to kind of start the design process and think about how to do it and unfortunately madeline wasn't able to be involved um over those years in the design itself because she cognitively wasn't there but she, we would spend a lot of nice time together. <laughs> At least I could watch. <laughs> um, and so here is the, uh, one of the final sketches of just the, the front elevation of the house. Um, we were able to actually get the elevator in um, and tuck it in under a dormer. So from the outside, you would never know that there is an elevator in that house, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so, <laughs> The biggest challenge with this project for me was actually working with the city. And in some ways, this is a kind of story where there were challenges, but I think the challenges led me to try to make change big picture. So um, I I think, I don't know. I'll, I'll just say that at the time, um, we were um, proposing to build a triplex, so three accessible units um, in the city of Vancouver, integrated in a wonderful neighborhood by Douglas Park, which was situated in between GF Strong, BC Women's Hospital, Vancouver General Hospital, BC Cancer. All of these facilities were both within wheelchair or walking or bus, like in very close proximity. There was a wonderful community with cafes and coffee shops and grocery stores. And I had to argue that this was a wonderful location to have accessible housing that was connected to community. I also had to argue that having three units facilitated a co-living environment where my cousin could have either living arrangements with other family members, with roommates, with caregivers, um, it offered a lot of flexibility and sustainability over time. So, so this was all um, news to me, like that I would really have to like go to Board of Variants and get 
dozens of letters from various accessibility organizations just to help push this project forward. And it took years, years to get the permit. Anyway, that aside, <laughs> um, this is the final floor plan. Of course, we went through millions of sketches, but when you have a very small floor print and you're asked to put in a triplex and multiple bedrooms and bathrooms, my aunt wanted to have two bedroom units on each floor. She wanted each unit to have two bathrooms, one accessible bathroom and one sort of semi-accessible bathroom for caregivers and, and family. All three floors were to be connected by an elevator. So I did achieve that. Um, spaces are small, um, but flexible. Uh, and um, so this is the south side of the house. All of the um, kitchens and living spaces face the south side. So lots of daylight coming in, um, access to outdoors on these balconies and decks. Um, so anyway, the process of um, construction, kind of fun to show. Um, I was very much involved in this project, both because um, this was, um, like it was a family project. So actually the general contractor um, was a um, a family connection as well. And he actually invited my boys uh, to the site a couple times to to loosely <laughs> do a little bit of work on site. But, um, and the strategy with this house, um, because it was a heritage house and the floor plan, the original floor plan was actually tiny and um, not usable. Um, we simply retain the exterior shell and the interior, the interior floor plan was completely changed, uh, completely gutted. The house was lifted. Um, the process here shows um, the house up on stilts and um, that facilitates an opportunity to put in new foundations, proper foundations, um, the city wouldn't let us lift the house in um, height at all. So we dug down the basement floor level so that um, there would be adequate um, ceiling height at the basement level. Um, and here's some pictures of construction. Very exciting when a project that takes many years actually comes to life. Um, and this attic space that used to just be a couple of rooms with almost no ceiling height became this wonderful daylight filled space um, with many bedrooms and bathrooms. So, um, and yeah, like along the way for construction, the challenge with a accessible um, project is um, when you're working with the general contractors, like they typically will work with kind of industry standards. Uh, materials that you can typically find, um, ways of doing things that have been done for for years and years. Um, and so when every single step of the way needs to be questioned, it's challenging, um, especially when it's your first accessibility focused project, to be constantly looking at every detail um, to, to, to make sure that it works and to find products that work for accessibility and So the outcome, I have very few pictures um, because um, COVID happened the moment sort of the project was available to move in. Um, and now all of the spaces are occupied. There are tenants living in the house um, and Madeline is happily living on the main floor and she has a lot of stuff and I just don't have pictures yet. So here are a few pictures that were taken um, I think for the website, um, for the rental website um, for the house. Um, this is the attic floor. The, the spaces feature a lot of, like, I think this is like a four foot wide pocket door. Um, so the rooms are not huge, but um, hallways are more generous and doors are wider. Um, materials are chosen for durability. Um, this was my 
first crack ever at doing kind of accessible kitchens. Um, and of course, my every user um, will have individual needs. My cousin in particular, because she uses a power chair and has armrests, um, she needed as much knee clearance as possible. And actually, a conventional height countertop works well for her. It's kind of neat that I threw in this little picture of a, a cart because um, for her, the cart is uh, an incredible device. Um, because she's hemiplegic, um, whether she's using her power chair or if she's um, walking with um, her cane and uh, brace, um, using the cart allows her to move stuff either around the house or to the kitchen and it offers additional storage. So when we designed this kitchen, the cart was always in mind. It would be kind of interesting to design a whole house based on the cart um, one day, but haven't been asked yet. Um, here are some more pictures um, of moving day and a picture of my cousin um, who is able to stand sort of for short periods, um, fully happy in the house with guests. Um, this is her cousin from Germany um, eating a meal together. Um, so for me, it's just been really happy to see um, her thriving in this house. Here are the kitchens that have open knee clearance. And I'm sure a lot of people who see these pictures will say, well, it's not fully accessible. Well, it's not, but there were a lot of decisions that were made along the line. And also when a homeowner has um, choices as well, like at the end of the day, that's what you build. So. And if I were to do this project again, I would do it very differently. And unfortunately, we have to learn from making mistakes. Um, so every time I go to the house, <laughs> I brace myself and say, OK, Madeline, tell me about all the things that you don't like, because <laughs> that's how I'm going to learn. So um, these are the bathrooms. Um, they all have all, all three floors have um, rolling showers with linear drain um, and knee clearance under sinks. It was all a challenge finding products for all of those things, but um, it was also fun. And yeah, so here's the, the house in its completed form. Um, Madeline with her, her mother on move-in day. Um, and here's a link for the house um, because it is actually um, a couple of the units are available for rent um, for a short or long-term stay. I still do some residential work. Here's a, a kitchen that I did recently for a family um, where sometimes, uh, you know, projects have people with varying needs. And this is a family that had, um, you know, uh, kids and um, partner. And so it has accessibility features, but also works for the whole family. Okay, next. Since Uli's here, I believe. This, um, the Rick Hansen Foundation certification is another pivotal moment in my journey um, in accessible design um, because it came out right around the time when I was doing the house for my cousin. Um, and I remember seeing an article in the newspaper about it. And I started contacting Rick Henson Foundation saying, oh, I want to do this training. Like, this sounds amazing. Sign me up. <laughs> and finally, I got into a course at VCC. Um, and I met a wonderful group of um, people. Um, they were not architects. There was maybe one or two architects in the group. So it was refreshing to have um, people from all different industries um, and people with lived experience in my class. I learned so much when you do a program like that. It's impossible to unlearn what you learn. You see the world in a different way, really. And I also feel that it was kind of so shocking and disappointing to me suddenly that I hadn't learned any of that material in architecture school. I mean, I went to school way back <laughs> just a while ago now, but um, it was just very um, informative. Um, and 
I'm I'm just showing a few um like yeah I mean I feel that the Rick Henson Foundation program just offers a very rich um, framework through which one can see every single project and um, just um, use it as a way to make sure that every aspect of a building is um, sort of viewed for accessibility. So um, another thing that um, was really important in my journey with accessible design was all the committee work that I started doing. And honestly, the reason why I started was because of the challenges that I faced with my cousin's project, um, because it took so long getting permits, because I noticed that there was very little knowledge of the issues um, from staff, um, the fact that I would have to go and provide massive rationale for this project that was only offering massive benefit to the, to the city. So um, instead of sitting there disgruntled and angry in my office, I applied to um, join the City of Vancouver Persons with Disabilities Advisory Committee. And luckily I was um, uh, accepted onto that one. And I also, uh, I've, I've been on a number of other committees, but this led to being involved on the City of Vancouver Urban Design Panel. And that came about because um, when I was on the PDAP committee, architects and um, planners would present projects to the committee that um, were often kind of done or finished. Um, and so I was like, wait a minute, we don't have anyone yet on the urban design panel um, that looks at accessibility. So um, the PDAC committee um, actually put together a motion for council um, asking that a person looking at accessibility be added to the panel. So we got that position on panel and then I immediately applied for it. And it's been really amazing um, just to be able to make space at the table for these ideas. Um, I just, I'm, I'm just really excited to see that there's more and more openness. And um, this is where I'm saying, like, I see a lot of change over the last seven years, like that we actually have someone on design panel now. Um, and I, I think, Anyway, <laughs> and then so I'm also on the, the Rick Hansen Technical Subcommittee now because I, I feel like after several years of working in this field, it's nice to be able to, to help with a program that I believe in so much. And uh, another little project that I did that has um, been part of my journey um, was uh, also over COVID. Um, Two of my very good friends that I met during my Rick Hansen training, uh, Julie and Samantha, um, we decided at one of, we, we reconvened at um, a Rick Hansen um, conference in Toronto um, a few years ago. And we had all kinds of fun ideas um, for projects to work on. And one of them was, okay, we need to create a document to help um, work with. Um, so when we do project consults or we do walkthroughs at sites, there are these things that come up all the time um, that are the same that relate to washrooms. And it would be nice to just have a little pamphlet that we can just give to those um, people and clients um, that just sort of outline what we uh, recommend. Um, of course, that pamphlet turned into the creation of a whole book. Um, we wrote this completely online. Uh, we met every week on Zoom. And um, I feel like this is a real um, sort of uh, a collabor collaborative process where we each took our own superpowers and contributed them to this project. Um, Julie is a wonderful writer, storyteller, educator. 
Samantha is more like the code guru. She's a code consultant. And um, I like to draw. So I did all the illustrations in the book. Um, so here are some of uh, examples of the images. Uh, so uh, I, I would draw them and then my colleagues would tell me, okay, that's wrong. You have to change this around. And so these drawings all went through hundreds of iterations and the final book um, has diagrams. It has uh, more specific notes about dimensions, but it also has um, Julie's written component that helps flesh out the, or explain the, the why behind why things are done in certain ways, which I think is really important and often missing from guidebooks. And here we are online trying to get the word out about our book. And here's Julie and her husband um, getting those books out um, through the mail. And I guess I will wrap up with just a few general thoughts. I mean, it's impossible to sum up accessible design in a little presentation. It really is. So um, I guess just some of the concluding remarks are just comments about some things that I have noticed over the last few years. I am not really able to show images of the projects that I work on um, as a consultant, um, but I am including a few pictures from my travels because whenever I go away, I can't help but notice accessibility features. Oops, sorry. So yeah, so the most of the work that I do currently is um, working as an accessibility or a consulting architect, I like to say, where I work with architects. Sorry, my phone is ringing off the hook. I work with other architects when they are developing new projects and they are trying to incorporate in, um, improved accessibility often through the inclusion of Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Principles. So I also um, have been working with city staff on some projects. Um, uh, I do a lot of review of projects through my design panel volunteer work. Um, and most recently, the consulting work um, has sort of been moving in the direction of larger urban scale developments. Um, and most recently as well, um, I have been doing a few um, accessibility focused upgrades at universities. So okay. it's moving very much away from doing residential projects, but I guess big picture working on this scale of work does have more impact on more people. Um, I guess when I'm talking about like how things are improving, the positivity, I just, I think it's amazing that say city of Vancouver and other municipalities are starting to embrace things like the Rick Hansen Foundation program or requiring gold certification for new projects, um, that's amazing and a wonderful move in the right direction. And that I also know there's a bunch of staff that I have been working with um, that have gone through the training as well. And so now when I talk with them, they speak the same language, they've seen the light, they like, <laughs> they've had the, the learning where they can't see the world in the same way anymore, which is just, Great. Um, and just having new legislate legislation, new codes and policies doesn't uh, harm anything either. Um, in the I do like to um, teach at the university a bit, uh, or at least get involved in design studios. And I'm seeing more and more openness to um, talking about inclusive, accessible design. Um, there are studios that are being taught at BCIT that look at accessible wayfinding, but, but this is only just the beginning and we still have a long way to go. 
here just a, a sampling of some of my photos that I take when I um, walk around the city. There's things like, um, so here's an example um, from Tokyo of, um, I guess, when we look at a glazed surface, um, we best practice is to put presence markers so that people can detect the glass, so that people don't walk into it. I always love to identify examples of creative interpretations of things like that. Here, one can see the decals that were applied were done by an artist. And I, I think one of my roles has been <laughs> like to take on the creative part and to get people excited to do things that are a little bit different. Um, so I collect, I collect inspiration when I walk around. Here's an idea of adding a, an armrest and a backrest to a bench. This was done by my old, uh, my previous professor, Bill Peckett. Um, and I think it's a nice way to tuck in a, a backrest and an armrest, often on projects all of the benches have no armrests and no backrests and and people don't know how to do that without like choosing a bench that has an armrest and a backrest but this is kind of a neat way to integrate that um what else and then i guess a few key concepts that do not kind of get um communicated through a building codes manual are things like um the why like why are things a certain way um one of the biggest things that my friend julie has um really taught me over the years is the preservation of energy and how important that is and like how do you communicate that in a building code it's really hard um but like when someone needs to use a, a building or a site and they use up all their energy to travel three kilometers to find an accessible washroom, or if one needs to go up a, a huge ramp um, and then use up all one's energy before getting to do the fun stuff. <laughs> like that's something that I found like working with design teams, like it's it's new to them, or or ideas of stigma. Um like having uh, a lift with loud beeping horns that go off when you have to activate it. That's that can be embarrassing and that can often be eliminated through um, careful design moves. And sometimes I think on projects, a ramp is put in and, and then it's, it's decided, okay, we've dealt with um, what we need to, but often there are ways around doing the ramp at all. So these are kind of big <laughs> ideas. And um, so I'm trying to just talk about some things that I've noticed recently. Here's a really neat um, accessible washroom that I saw in Japan. Um, there were so many interesting washroom examples when I was there, um, but it even has a little sink right next to the toilet that kind of flushes everything's tidy and organized there are two emergency call buttons one that's up high and one that's down low at floor level the washrooms have two sinks um, for hand washing one next to the toilet and one over to the side i don't even know how it all is to work but it's just um, really great to observe and notice and get ideas when we travel around um and yeah i guess again, to communicate opportunity for creativity when I consult with other architects, um, just seeing um, things like this washroom sign, which was all tactile. It was at an old temple or a palace. And so they incorporate the, the beauty of the wood and the colors and everything. And, and so they have these tactile maps that show all the, this doesn't include strangely inaccessible cell. I think that was separate, but it, it's a floor plan that shows all the features that are in the washroom and it's tactile and you can feel um, the layout um, and it explains, it's really hard to see in this image. And here is um, an interesting um, thing that I saw in some of the train stations where 
there'd be a sound beacon that would emanate through the hall. So you knew to come over to this station with the attention warning strip. Um, and then there was a tactile map um, that shows a layout of the station. Anyway, I could go on and on, but um, I, I'm just wanting to show like an example of like how I go around the world, uh, collect ideas, and then kind of show them to um, others to hopefully inspire as well. It's fascinating. I love the the uh, house you built. That's just so inviting. Uh, this is really really good. And what what I uh, direction that you're taking is really lovely to see Jane thank you Maureen I, I really appreciate that <laughs> well it's a very good presentation I've enjoyed it thank you so I mean in my last slide I just wanted to quickly show like um, it, it's nice to have an opportunity to talk about what one does because it was a moment to kind of stand back and look at um, what I am doing and some um, I think it's very easy in this field of work to get really buried in guidelines and writing reports. And it's reminding me <laughs> that I actually had a lot of fun working on that house for my cousin. So I'm hoping to get more into the creative side again. But anyway, I'm just wondering if anyone has any questions or comments or thoughts. We just need more people like you, a lot more. <laughs> I appreciate your talent and your enthusiasm. Thank you. Hi, Jane. It's Kim here. I met you at the Rick Hansen uh, conference recently. Hi, Kim. Um, yeah. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for um, doing this presentation. And you mentioned um, wherever you go, you, you've got your eyes out and looking at what's accessible and improving accessibility. And it's just a reminder for everyone on this screen and whoever listens to it later that it's something we all need to work at. It's not just one person who can change the city, the province, the nation, the world. It takes all of us to do that. But thank you so much for spreading um, awareness and um, keeping an eye out wherever you go for this kind of thing. I found the uh, toilet that you showed interesting example in Japan where they spent so much time trying to make a perfect washroom and yet most of us wouldn't be able to use that toilet. Right. At least most of the people I know I don't think could really properly use that toilet. Maybe in a pinch, I don't know. But that's when accidents happen, right? And falls occur. And um, But Jane, I do have yeah. a question. I'm wondering, especially with the legislation coming up September 1, um, how are the, um, how do you find the city inspectors um, and working with you when we renovated our house and we wanted to put in a toilet um, and a bathroom in particular, because you talked a lot about bathrooms and we all need that. Um, we had we had done a cutout um, beneath the sink so that I could get under the sink. I use um, a wheelchair for those who don't know. Um, and the first city inspector improved it. And then the second person said, oh no, you can't do that. But I needed to because I have to, to get under the sink. Um, anyways, I did write a letter and after a long, lot of work, um, the manager came and we, it was dealt with and he came to the house. But um, how are the city inspectors generally? Have you got any experience or comments on that? Um, all over the map. Um, so I've kind of, I mean, even so that project for my cousin, I guess, I don't know, Kim, if you were here for the first piece uh, about my cousin's house, but um so we had three except we had a number of washings in that project and um i remember when the inspector came for that project he was asking for certain things that wouldn't work for my cousin and so at first the the contractor called me he's like oh no we don't know what to do like we have to change it and i'm like no let me get on the phone here so I actually called up the inspector and it outlined like why and what was going on. And, and he was quite receptive, um, luckily, um, because he, he personally had people with um, disabilities in his own family and <laughs> every project's different. And um, I'm hoping that um, 
inspectors as well. Like it goes all the way down from people chucking the, the drawings down to what's happening on site. Um, if everyone has a certain level of understanding and training, then those kinds of issues like what you experience hopefully will start to go away. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, because like I know that code has certain accessibility aspects um, outlined that are required for certain projects, but sometimes they just don't work for your own particular, like if it's your own personal home, like you should be able to build something that you can use. So, or there should be at least uh, avenues to take if situations like that come up, like a direct line where you can say, okay, this came up and then have people that are trained in accessibility that um, that can look at it quickly and process it quickly. I don't know, there's probably things that are happening now that I'm not aware of. I know things are getting better, but. Hmm. And yeah, I, I don't know if I communicated properly in my presentation. I, I think I wrote a note, but I probably forgot to talk about it that, um, one of the biggest things that is just absolutely on the forefront of my mind now doing any kind of accessible design, one really does need to work with and involve people with disabilities, people with lived experience. One cannot design quietly in a corner without consulting and listening and watching and paying people with lived experience to be involved in projects. So. Yeah. Hey, Jay. This is Ben. Thank you so much. I think you and I are chatting later this week, actually. Oh, on what project? <laughs> uh, well, it's about Nick and the uh, about bathrooms, actually. Oh. Yeah. Is that right? Or maybe that's not true. I it, are, are you at UBC? Yeah. Yeah. Was that with Julie? Uh, no. Well, maybe it was Julie. I don't know. Anyway, well, I, your name came up in my email, so. We'll figure, I'll figure it out later. Um, yeah, well, that's interesting. So your name, your name was floated by me anyway. Anyway, no, thank you very much for that presentation. It's really great. Um, I guess I was curious about the connections between uh, you've got code, which is sort of prescriptive and and doesn't consider actually the outcomes, and you've got the Rick Hansen certification, which is sort of post creation, and it feels like there's some tensions there. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we try and I don't know make the two work together maybe maybe better. I feel like I feel like Uli, who's on the call, should should I'd comment happy, on that one. <laughs> I'd be happy to speak about that. So it it there's no tension because the uh, RHFAC ratings uh, look at pre-construction for uh, first, okay. and uh, and then uh, built environment also. So th there's two different types of ratings, and Jane has done many of those different ratings and, and uh, uh, does really good work. Uh, so the built environment, you're kind of identifying all the barriers that you might uh, see in the drawings that will take shape in the built environment. And, and those, that's the time to identify them and, and have the ability to build to a gold certification. It uh, only costs about 1% of the building uh, cost to build to gold certification. Uh, and that exceeds any code in, Brit in, in British Columbia or Canada for that fact. Uh, and it probably about best practice around the world for the most part. Uh, we take the best features we can find from around the world and incorporate them into our rating survey. And Jane, uh, we're fortunate to have Jane on our committee uh, doing good things. We're, we're just, we're working towards version four now and uh, the next one will be version five. And I'm sure Jane, Jane will still be uh, involved in, in, in that version of it. So uh, yeah, just to clarify that th there is no conflict. It, it's an opportunity to uh, build your site uh, to an accessibility standard that meets the use for all people uh, using universal design as the main concept. Yeah, I guess it was, Jane was sort of intimating that there were some issues with code actually getting in the way of accessibility. And I guess I was trying to try and tease that out a little more. I'll give you a good example of that. So uh, areas of refuge, uh, we prescribe that uh, there should be an area of refuge of some sort 
on every floor for people with disabilities so that they have the equal opportunity to get out of a building. And that would also apply to visual alarms. So people who are deaf uh, have uh, a fighting chance of knowing that there is an emergency that has broken out and they will be signaled that there is in fact an emergency that, that is happening. Without them, you would have no, if you were a deaf person, you'd have no idea that, th that this was about to happen. Uh, so in areas of refuge are not in code. They're, they've been taken out. That is changing the Accessibility Standards Committee, which I'm on uh, for, for Canada for the reform of National Building Code, is bringing back in areas of refuge. So that's a, that's a huge change. It was taken out because it seemed to be cost prohibitive and not factoring in the value of life. Uh, so it is now uh, back in the standard uh, when it comes out, and it'll be a few years before that uh, comes into play. However, it's a good step in the right direction uh, and, and the codes will catch up as time goes on. So if, if people are building a new site now, why not be ahead of the game and put an area of refuge in there for people like Kim to shelter in place? I think also, uh, Ben, I think when I was talking about codes, I think some of the issues were maybe I think as designers, before we really get a closer, more intricate understanding of accessibility needs, that we think that just following the accessibility portion of building code, then that we're, we're I don't know if that's, that's maybe too basic an answer, but like if we, and, and I think say current city of Vancouver um, building code requirements, I think a five foot turning radius is adequate where really it's not quite up to snuff. Like really it should be the in the six foot range at least. Um, so uh, yeah, and also I think it's like that um, when one's working with a building code as the document, um, it's not saying why you need to do certain things the way you need to. So I don't know how to get around that. If the codes and requirements just need to be written in a different way, that kind of. Well, <laughs> Jane, yeah. you brought up a couple of great things uh, in your description from your travels, and that was the emergency call button. Uh, code dictates that it's uh, mounted at about a thousand millimeters in that range uh, off the finished floor. And Jane, you pointed out that they're available at two heights. So if, if you have fallen onto the floor, you have the opportunity of, of hitting that emergency call button. Um, and without it, it you, a lot of people cannot reach that upper, upper reach. Their reach just doesn't take them to that level. Uh, and you know, literally you have to drag yourself maybe to the door if you can do that to try to get some help. Uh, and uh, I have a partner here where that happened. Uh, uh, wasn't able to uh, get any help and had to actually pull herself to the door to, to get help uh, at a community center. Uh, those type of things happen all the time. Uh, and, you know, installing toilets without seat backs, for example, we see those all the time. You go into a stadium and you see a toilet meets code, t totally meets code, but it doesn't meet usability for everyone. Uh, without a seat back, a lot of people can't use that toilet and might just as well just go home. And I think if we, we just keep building things that the way that they're always built, like, so I think Kim raised a really good point. Okay, there's this beautiful washroom in Japan that like a lot of thought went into, but it doesn't work for a lot of people that Sashi knows. Um, so. I just think one can, I guess my approach is to like, look at different variations, keep a very critical mind because a lot of things don't work. <laughs> but then there's always things that, oh, like that, that could be good. And one needs examples to show to design teams, like actually you can have two buttons. It's not crazy because it has been done elsewhere. Like the fact that there's an, another little sink next to the toilet, like most people, if they heard that, they'd be like, what the heck? Like, you can't do that. And I'm like, well, actually you can, <laughs> here's an example. So I don't know, it's it's interesting and useful to um, 
it's like this whole thing with when I was working on my first um, house project where the contractor is always talking about, oh, well, industry standard, that's how we do it. Well, sometimes you have to completely go away from that, rethink the whole thing completely, whether it be bathroom design or the way that you do kitchens or the type of hardware you use on doors. Like maybe stop looking at what is done always, completely zoom out, think about a completely different way of doing it, then engage with people with disabilities. Does this work? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's quite the process. Even like working on the project uh, for my cousin, like it's really hard finding products um, in Vancouver that work for a project. And then and then also find products that work with a budget <laughs> and that are durable and that are easy to use. Every single thing like, oh, window hardware for a residential project. No one knows about how to find window like the the sales reps no one that I talked to was aware at all of window hardware that's easy to open so every single thing's like a huge research project like <laughs> okay let's go and try every single window in the city do any of them kind of open easily no <laughs> you can find beautiful examples from Germany but those that cost an absolute arm and a leg and are not possible to get Anyway, I could go on and on about this, but <laughs> it's uh, fun to talk about. Anyway, I don't know if it's up to us to end, end it. It's uh, 12.55, and I don't know if there's any other exciting comments. Yeah, um, just before we leave, I wanted to say thank you so much, Jane, for... Uh, I know many, some of the people who wanted to come aren't able to come. So um, I gather it'll be available online with Connectra after this, because um, I see it's being recorded. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Jane, because we all need to raise awareness out there. And the more each of us, um, you know, create awareness so that that the people in the industry realize that it's not all just it's not a one size fits all kind of situation for us. Um, everybody's different. Um, and Jane has a very good understanding of that. And mm -hmm. I know so do a lot of the assessors who work for the Rick Hansen found, or who took the Rick Hansen Foundation Assessors Program and really appreciate all of you, you know, raising the bar and letting people know. And but I would also say it's incumbent on us as users to to take that extra step as well, not just for ourselves, but for everyone else. So thank you for coming. Great job. Thank you.